Hey, what's up? How are you? websites, programming helpers, uh, X509 generation, like you name it, I probably built something related to it. So uh, getting started, um, first thing we talk about, uh, same origin policy, pretty much every talk about browser security talks about same origin policy, so I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it, but just the general idea is that when you visit an untrusted site, that site should be able to manipulate your sessions that you've already played in one of your trusted sites. And so basically it says no DOM access to um, other websites. And so this is nice because it gives each developer a little play area that for them to build a website and not have to worry about other sites messing with it. And so if we didn't have same origin policy, stuff like this would be possible. Um, this isn't real code. Um, it's just kind of super code, and obviously this doesn't work because we have same policy, but you can see if a user was to go to first third mybank.com, authenticate, and then go to evil.com, evil.com would be able to do something like this, where um, you see the title is evil, and they have the script, and they are able to grab the CRS um, CSERP token. Um, we're not going to cover CSERPs in this talk, but um, if you don't know what that is, I'll look it up. It's a pretty common attack. Um, and then they will be able to make requests on your behalf um, from that tab to like transfer money or do anything that the client would be able to do. So obviously it's great that we have same origin policy. So, um, but since we have same origin policies, hackers have still been trying to get around this. And one of the ways that they've been successfully getting around for a while is a thing called cross-site scripting, which is XSS. And the idea behind XSS is uh, browsers trust pretty much everything it receives, the content it receives from the server, like it should. When you go to Facebook.com, you expect to get Facebook.com Facebook and execute the scripts from Facebook.com, which is good. And so XSS makes the scripts like it came from the server, and so the browser executes those scripts like it should. So another example that doesn't work, thank God, is you can imagine yourself on Twitter typing a status like, so excited for apps like Cali, um, CSP for life. And when you post this, right underneath you'll have your little tweet box, and you'll, you'll be able to see it like, yay, it got posted, and it got rendered within the HTML. So a malicious person um, could potentially try something like this, where so excited for apps like Cali 2015, and then have a script source, evil.com slash evil.js. And so if Twitter was vulnerable to this, um, this would obviously, the, this, the script source would be rendered in the HTML, and then would be executed, and they would be able to execute any code that they had hosted on evil.com, which would be a very bad thing. Fortunately, this doesn't work with Twitter. Um, yeah. So uh, a couple quick types of XSS. Um, the one we just looked at was called a stort um, or a persistent XSS. Uh, there's two others. Um, there's reflected, uh, non-persistent. This is uh, what, this is usually done through like a URL message. So like you have an error message page. So like if something goes wrong on the server, it'll just send this back, and uh, this message gets reflected. So it just gets the server takes that message error message query string, puts it into its HTML, and gets rendered with like a big red box or something. And so hackers can sometimes put like a script source in there, and it just gets reflected. Um, and then they usually use a URL shortener. Um, fortunately, you don't see too many of these anymore. Um, thanks to things like XSS Auditor and WebKit, it seems to kind of be dying out, just from my experience. Um, and then the last type is DOM-based. Um, in this example, the server doesn't actually participate. 
on the server will respond. So the client will ask for example.com with this default query string with a, an XSS injection, but the server doesn't actually handle it. It's all done on the client side, so the client side will like window.location and grab the screws, query string and do something with it and like put it into the DOM itself, but the server doesn't really play with it at all. This is all done on the client side. So obviously this is a big problem. Normally during this talk, people would talk about or give a statistic about how bad XSS is and how many millions of dollars are lost or something. But I think we all know that this is a big problem. And so a bunch of smart people got together, maybe some people in this room, and they wrote a draft. Uh, I don't recognize anyone, but I don't know too many faces. But uh, a bunch of smart people got together and they created a thing called content security policy. And that's what uh, this talk is about, and the reporting. So content security policy, the official definition is uh, what's written up there, but the idea is that um, your website can tell the browsers what content it should allow and which content it should. And it specifies the intent of the website. And so in this thing it sends down the policy. I write down CSP policy. I know that's like ATM machine, but when I say policy, I mean like the actual policy string. So the server sends down this policy along with the website. Um, they can send it in either an HTTP header or a meta tag. And what the policy says is, hey, I only want you to download JavaScript from these valid sources like a.com or b.com. Only download CSS from a.com and only download images from these sources. And don't download anything else because it's a whitelist. So if the browser came across something like evil.com slash evil.js, this would not be rendered. And so in more official terms, um, you will have a list of directives and values. Um, so you have content security policy and it'll have something like default source, which just means um, if it's a directive is not explicitly listed later, go all use this fallback of self. And self means you can load anything from the same origin, which is an origin is defined by scheme, host, and port. That, uh, that's the uniqueness trip or tuple. tuple. So then you also uh, like a script source. This is where you can download scripts from. Uh, so for this example, you can download scripts from self, from jQuery and Bootstrap. And then um, you can download styles from Bootstrap. And the report URI says if there's any violation, um, if the browser encounters something that it shouldn't be able to handle, or it should, um, if it gets like evil.com or something like that, it's going to send a report to casper.io endpoint. So um, I put up all the directives. I don't think we need to cover them. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, like we just talked about default source and script source. Um, you can kind of guess like script source only allows scripts from these places, images, styles, fonts, connects. These all make sense. For connects, um, connects can be web sockets, AJAX, or event sources, um, three different ways, mechanisms the browsers use. Um, and then there's a lot of advanced directives, especially in the new draft. Um, media kind of goes up with the, the, the previous page, there just wasn't room. Media is anything in a video, audio, or source uh, element, or track element. There's a lot of new advanced ones, um, I, or I call them advanced directives. They don't really fall in with the others, but they still provide a lot of uh, security benefits. Um, one of the ones that gets mentioned a lot is frame ancestors. Or you can use that as your new XFO tag or header, which is X frame options um, for working on like UI redressing attacks. Um, but they also have things like child sources, form actions, like where uh, your eyes can be used as the action of an HTML form element. Um, you can treat your content as a sandbox. You can specify how you want prefers to handle, so you don't get prefer leaking when switching between mixed content. Um, the plugin types, so like if you only want your page to load PDFs or X Shockwave Flash or something like that. And then you can also instruct the browser on how it should handle um, XSS uh, reflective protections. So like we talked about uh, XSS Auditor a minute ago, you can say, hey, I want you to only block, or hey, I don't want you to use the blocking of this feature, um, which is really similar to the X XSS protection header. So this CSP kind of gives you three headers in one, which is kind of cool, in the, the new version 1.1. And so, uh, what we'll be focusing mostly on is this thing called uh, the report URI. Um, so, the report URI is uh, an endpoint you can specify so that when there is a report violation, um, your endpoint will know, like, hey, what went wrong, and it gives a nice detailed report with a lot of information, which we're covering. Um, so, there's also some director values. Um, most of these are also self explanatory. Uh, host, um, like we saw in a previous example, so a directive can have a value of a host, which is like bootstrap.com or jQuery.com. Um, and posts are unique by scheme, host, and port. Um, then there's wildcard or star, which means you can accept uh, values for this directive from anywhere. Then there's the none type, which is the most secure. If you could have none, that's fantastic. It just means don't load resources from anywhere. Uh, self is from the same place, so scheme, host, or port. The same scheme, host, and port. And then you can also specify things like scheme. Um, uh, so if you only, like a lot of times when you see 
uh, image, so image source, you'll see that'll only allow data, um, which is uh, like if you have an image representation like base64, um, that's fine. Normally that'll be blocked by something if you have like a, a none for image source, but it's saying you can load image that have the type scheme data. Or you only want to load things that are over HTTPS, which is pretty common to see for like images. Um, some more directive types. Um, so when a browser receives content from a website, is there any way it can differentiate between if that content came from an attacker or from the server? And obviously the answer is no, because if it could, then we wouldn't really have XSS. So when you're looking, at, so when the, the browser receives this HTML and it sees inline JavaScript, there's no way that it can tell if this JavaScript is good or bad. And so because of this, you actually have to remove all inline. Um, it's just uh, one of the downsides of CSP, but um, it's just it, it's the way it has to be. Um, so if you, for some reason, must have inline um, JavaScript or style sheets, um, you can use this directive called unsafe inline. And that'll allow you to do this. Um, you lose a lot of the security benefits of CSP. There's other reasons to still use CSP besides um, this XSS protection, like we talked about XFO and XSSX um, protection headers. Um, but this is the main benefit of CSP is uh, XSS and having unsafe inline uh, kind of negates that. So there's also unsafe eval. CSP by default blocks evals, um, set timeouts, set intervals, new functions when used in string format. Um, this just allows arbitrary execution of code. Um, you can still use set timeouts and set intervals with a function, just not with a string. So um, 1.1 1 .1 also introduced two new concepts, uh, nonces and hashes. Um, sometimes you have like a Google Analytics script on the bottom of your HTML page, and you want to allow that. You just don't want to move into its own thing because it's <coughs> static on its own JS file. So you can now add nonces. Um, and so these are just random identifiers, kind of like CSERP tokens. What these allow you to do is you can have a, like a script, you see kind of hoop right there, it says script nonce is equal to this, and in your header, you just say nonce of this value, and so when your browser is rendering the HTML, if it sees something with the nonce value, it just checks the header and makes sure those two correlate, and if it does, then it allows the script to execute. So you can do that with nonces, just make sure they're random, and you can also take the hash of the contents of the script tag, and if the contents, the hash of the script matches what's in the header, um, so you say like SHA-256 is a big value, if those two match, then the script will also allow it, will be allowed to execute. So two different ways you can have inline. Um, you still have to be careful with them, but uh, they're out there. So um, if you built a policy, you probably, and installed a policy on a website, you've probably seen something like this. Um, this is Twitter. If uh, you were to use a really bad uh, policy, you can see it's really messy and gross. Um, probably not what you want. And you probably saw a lot of uh, violation reports. Or if you looked at your console, you saw a lot of like these red error messages telling you what you had done wrong. And obviously, yeah, this is not what you want. But the violation reports are actually super useful. Um, they tell you exactly where the problem was. Um, so when you have an error message, first thing you'll notice is uh, in your console, you'll get this, you know, refuse to load style sheet. Um, this was on uh, my blog, and it said they didn't want to load Bootstrap because it violated the content security policy directive. <coughs> Uh, default source done, um, so nothing was allowed to be loaded, and so obviously a through message. Um, if I had a your report URI uh, installed on this policy, it would also send on um, the report with the following fields um, to that endpoint, and it's all in JSON, so it would have a document URI, you revise the document which was uh, where the violation occurred, the refer, the refer of the document in which the violation occurred, the blocked URI, so the resource, or the URI of the resource that was blocked, and then the violated directive and the original policy, which is all pretty self-explanatory. So, but actually these reports actually turn out to be extremely useful when building a, a policy, and you can actually have these reports do all the work for you when building a policy. So, um, when you receive a bunch of reports, um, these are kind of sample reports up at the top. You could suppose, like, let's say you set up a report URI and you set a really restricted policy. You're going to receive a whole bunch of reports and they'll kind of look something like this. So you'll see you, you got a blog to URI of Bootstrap, uh, that violated the directive of style source, um, the block to URI of bootstrap again, that violated directive of a script source, um, a block to URI of jQuery uh, with the violated directive of script source, and you know, two others. And so using these values, I mean, it pretty much tells you exactly what's going wrong uh, with your policy. And so if you just parse this JSON, you can build a policy directly from that, and which we're going to talk about a little bit later, which is the tool that I used to take care of some of these problems. Another problem you'll have is uh, when uh, installing a policy, 
every single client of yours is going to receive this policy, and so if there is something wrong with the policy, they're going to receive a lot of reports. So an example of GitHub was to install a policy, but the report arrived at csp.github.com. Every single client that gets that policy is going to send violation reports to csp.github.com. So you're going to get a lot of duplicates and a lot of data really fast. And it can be kind of frustrating to go through. So uh, when building a reporting and policy mechanism, it's important to have some sort of aggregation function so you're not just looking at the same data over and over and over. So um, other problems with uh, CSP reporting, um, normalization. A lot of browsers have their own little uh, quirks. Um, they're actually really not that bad though. Um, sometimes they might just have an extra field or something. I never really saw, it didn't really seem too bad. Um, one thing that's pretty helpful though with normalization is on the document URI and block URI, sometimes we'll have paths and they're really not too important. Usually you're just kind of interested in the domain. Um, so usually on Casper anyways, uh, those get stripped down. And then also pretty useful for normalization is when you get these reports. You get reports for different reasons. So like maybe a bad eval, like a JavaScript eval that shouldn't have been there. Maybe it's blocking a host or maybe it was inline. It's kind of useful to classify them when you receive the report. And uh, this is from Neil's um, blog. I'm sure Neil Matatal, one of the runners of this event, <coughs> used to do a lot of CSP at Twitter. Um, and I, I've seen this too. You get a lot of junk um, in your CSP reports, like ISPs might be injecting crap. Sometimes you just get random ads and you're not really sure where they're from. A lot of just clients, maybe they have malware on their system that are generating reports um, that you don't want. There's just a lot of noise in the report, so you want some way to filter those out. And so along with the information that's included in all the reports, um, you also get a lot of information that you can kind of glean, like meta information. So you get the IP address of the client. Um, I don't really think it's too useful. Maybe if you could prove that like certain IP locations are more susceptible to like uh, ISP injection or something, but um, it's there if, someone, if you need it for some reason. Another useful information gained from reports, since it's an HTTP post, you can also grab user agent screens to see like how different browsers are handling different things. And of course, you can grab the timestamp, which is also very useful. Um, build the classification off of uh, how the browser sends them, so you can look at like uh, if the violated um, source was empty or not, you know if it was an inline, or if it was an eval, or if it was a blocked host. And then another thing you can do with um, violation reports for the URI is you can add a query string. And so whenever you receive a HTTP post to your endpoint, you can see that query string and you can use that to identify uh, where the violation report came from or any other information about that client that you wanted to see. So, so that's the background of report URIs. Um, now we're going to talk about Casper. So um, I was building a CSP reporting system back at MongoDB uh, last summer, back when I was an intern there. Um, they had a couple of internal tools, and uh, they had a lot of XSS problems that I got to have fun with. I built my own little sandy worm, and they had like a little profile page, and I um, made a couple like clicking attacks. Um, and so eventually they were like, Stuart, you need to stop doing this, and you need to go fix all this stuff. And so <laughs> um, at first I was just going to like do what normal people do, is you know, check the encoding, you know, and uh, filter it properly, but eventually someone was like, hey, you should check out content security policy. So I tried you know, doing content security policy, and over the course I ran into all these problems, like I tried building a policy, and it turns out building a policy is kind of hard, and you end up with a bunch of websites like this, and it's very frustrating, or you'll end up with like too many reports, and you're not really sure what all these reports mean, and so that's where Casper came in, and so that was my accumulation of work um, that I did for a little bit of how we So, um, the background of Casper, so building cost policy is a lot of work, um, like I said, the problems earlier, it's easy to miss something, you have to manually check each page for the content, make sure you're loading everything correctly, and reports can be confusing. So the idea behind Casper is what you can do is instead use those violation reports to your benefit. Um, instead, just install a ridiculous policy on that website, collect a whole bunch of reports, and then Casper will just filter through those reports and build the policy for you. Make it way simpler instead of like trying to find everything. So Casper has three things. Um, the first thing it does is it's an endpoint for collecting CSP reports. Um, CSP reports sometimes aren't parse file the frameworks correctly, they have a mind type of X for application CSP report, which doesn't get handled by like Node.js by default, which is kind of frustrating, so uh, Casper handles little bugs like that. Um, it's an API uh, for managing and downloading CSP reports, so it's like a, it stores all the CSP reports and it's, it makes an easier way for you to grab them, and uh, easier way to manage them. And then of course it's also a front end for viewing and aggregating 
and filtering the other reports. So you can find it on GitHub, Conrad Casper, um, the standard mean stack, MongoDB, Express, Angular, Node.js, kind of like hipster tools, but not so much hipster anymore. And so, first thing up, uh, it's an endpoint. Um, so it creates endpoints for project. I'm going to go through installing a CSP, or installing a CSP on a website in a minute. So we're just covering this, so then we'll show you how it actually works. But um, it uh, creates endpoints for projects. So this is the report URI you will use um, once you uh, have everything set up. Um, every report received is on the endpoint is normalized, classified, filtered, um, and filled out with the auxiliary data. And then I use MongoDB on the back end, so all the data just goes into a MongoDB collection. Um, like I said, it has a, a RESTful API. Um, you interact with the service through the RESTful API. I put like a little front end on it, which we'll see in a second, but pretty much all that's doing is interacting with these routes that are on the back end. Um, you have RESTful API, so it has four things it consumes. Well, the first one is projects. Um, each, I kind of, each project should probably have, uh, when you're building a new policy string, that's when you create a new project. And so you'll have a project um, for like pretty much each website you want to install CSP on. So the, you can create new projects, get new projects, delete new projects, standard sort of restful stuff. Um, each, you can grab all the reports for a project or delete all the reports for a project. Um, and then you can also uh, get the groups. So like I said, a lot when you send or when you install CSP um, on your server, all of your clients are going to get that CSP policy, and so you're going to generate a lot of reports, and a lot of those reports are the exact same. Um, so what Casper also does is it aggregates all those, so any report that looks similar just kind of groups them together and creates an Instagram for you, since you don't want to filter that out. Um, and then you can also get any group that's associated with the report, which I'll kind of show what that looks like on the front end. And then, uh, it also does filtering. Um, like Neil said, uh, a lot of people have seen like 66% of the reports you're going to receive are garbage. Um, if you put it in prod, if you do it on your own system, you won't have too much garbage, but if you do it on prod, you're just going to get a lot of garbage and you're not really sure what it does. Um, so filters are a way to kind of get rid of all that garbage, so you're only looking at real data. So, uh, now we're going to mess around with Casper. So, um, to get to Casper, just go to github.com slash Platform as a service. Um, basically, we're going to create a new project. <laughs> All right. Deploy for free. It's free if you want to set up Casper. Um, you just have to create a Heroku account. And so, uh, while this is setting up, we're going to talk about um, the next tool. Because uh, it takes a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll come right back to it. So one of the problems is when you're installing CSP, um, it's kind of an iterative approach. You're going to be t testing a policy out, and that policy always doesn't work at first. Um, so then you have to go back to your server and actually manually edit your server and change the policy screen, which is kind of frustrating. So I hated doing that over and over and over. So I created a little Chrome extension called Enforcer, which doesn't show up the best on the screen. But um, basically, it's a Chrome extension. Um, what it does is uh, when your web browser makes a request, it sends like a get request to Facebook, you know, get index by HTML. Um, your Facebook web server responds with some comment um, content, like HTTP OK on the bottom right with the content type, a bunch of stuff. Then Enforcer picks it up, and Enforcer just enforces on whatever CSP policy you want to kind of make it look like it came from the server. And so you can rapidly test CSP policies on other people's websites that you don't even know, uh, which is super handy. So like I can, you can test CSP for a web server you don't own and build a policy for them, and then you can just hand them the policy string and be like, hey, here's the policy that'll work with your website just fine. So, um, like I said, it's a Chrome extension for building a policy. 
um, intercepts web requests, it's built in HTML, CSS, JS, Angular, um, and you can find it on Conrad uh, Enforcer. Um, if you just Google CSP Conrad Enforcer, it'll pop up, it's the first thing. Okay, we're going to go back to the demo thing. So this is Casper. Um, it just gives some information about what CSP is and stuff that you already know. So we're going to click get started. Um, so first thing you do is create a project. Um, I was thinking we could uh, install CSP or sudo install CSP on the scheduling app, the AppSex California 2015. I saw that it doesn't have CSP, so we'll just install CSP on that. So AppSec, uh, the, the scheduling thing. Okay, so uh, here is uh, the first dashboard. Um, it's kind of coming in fuzzy, but uh, here is the policy that you would add to your website. Um, it gives you a list of the uh, reports, um, the number of unique reports, because a lot of the reports will be duplicates, um, some actions. Uh, eventually, we're going to have like import and backup and all that stuff, but it doesn't really seem like anyone wants it. Um, and then some settings, uh, hiding projects, uh, which I'll talk to you about in a second. You can delete all the reports and delete all the projects. So first thing you do um, is you capture this uh, policy and you go back to the website you want to test. And so this is the little Chrome extension up here. Um, you just click that. Uh, this is Enforcer. So what we can do is we want to enable it and we want to, this is Content Security Policy. So you can run Content Security Policy in two different modes um, as enforcing the policy or report only mode. In report only mode, when it finds the violation, it sends the violation report, but it doesn't actually block anything. It's useful for like, if you want to roll out CSP, but you don't want to disrupt your users because you're not expecting this to how to work out, this is perfect because you'll only get the reports. But we actually want to, and we don't care, because this isn't, this isn't real. Not if we're the only people that are going to be seeing this report. So we set up this pretty, um, uh, not obtrusive, but you know, pretty strong uh, policy. It has a default source of none, meaning it doesn't allow anything by default. But then it says, allow script sources from self. I assume that self is safe. Allow connect source from self. Image source from self, style source from self, font source from self, and the report you arrive. And so, uh, Casper automatically uh, fills all that in. So, uh, we've refreshed the page now that it's enabled. <coughs> okay, popped up. We can see it looks like a mess. This is exactly what we wanted. I got a whole bunch of, that means all the reports were blocked. We can see it kind of down here, kind of hard to read, but basically these are saying like inline script was blocked, um, or inline scripts, maybe some content was blocked, exactly what we want. So if we go back to Casper, refresh, we can see, woo, from a couple page refreshes, we got 36 reports. Fantastic. And so I'm just going to refresh this a couple more times, just so we get some more reports. We can take a good look at Casper. At what point does Heroku start charging you? Um, it doesn't. Really? Yeah, it's just pretty. Yeah. If you want to scale it up, though, I think it's like thirty-five dollars per instant. If you want to scale it up to like two instances running behind like a load balancer, but Casper is, handles about thirty thousand reports without any problem. About once you get to about thirty thousand reports, then it gets kind of grumpy. At that point, you can just delete your reports and start fresh. Like you don't need to hold on to all those old reports. Anyways, so uh, we have thirty-six, forty-five. Good enough. Anyways, we go down to this analyze tab. Um, so here we have like nice little graphs. I'm sorry this is coming in fuzzy. I wish it came in a little bit better. But um, it just tells you uh, the type. So um, this is some it's a script source, an authorized host. Uh, we have a style source, which was inline. It tells you where this happened. Um, image source, where it happened. Um, you can change like how you want to look at the different data. Like you can monitor your policy, how it changed over an hour, a day, a week, a month. That's what this says here. Hour, day, a week, or a month. And then you can also change the bucket size. So um, it gets a timestamp of when it was received. And you can say, I want you to group reports into buckets. So right now it's looking at a bucket size of a minute or an hour or a day. And so right now it's looking at um, all the reports that happened today. Um, and each bucket is of size of an hour. So we did it at like, I guess at 10.59 and a little bit after 11. So you can see things in two different buckets, which is perfect. And then you can, uh, you can look at specific um, directives. 
So if you only want to look at like scripts or something, you can turn it on and off. And then uh, the group limit number of graph series are just different ways to look at the data. So here are the actual groupings of different reports. Um, sorry, it's hard to see, but so this first one says image source. Um, it has a direct type of image source, and it says the block to arrive was static.sketch.org. And so you know exactly you know what's wrong there. I tried to load an image from static.sketch.org, but it didn't allow it. You can look at some details. Um, this will tell you uh, specifically for that report how many of those reports you've gotten over time and what they look like. So it kind of groups everything up for you. Which is nice. Um, going down, we saw we have a here we have a script source um, right here. Script source that was blocked from s7.addis.com. So another thing we need to add uh, another script source from cdn.schedule.ws. So um, just a useful panel tells you where everything is. So up here is the policy builder. Um, so right here, um, this is the policy that Casper lost, last saw for this project. Um, that was the one we put into Enforcer, uh, this little guy. Um, and this is the proposed policy that it thinks that you can maybe use. So pretty much you just go down here. It took all those reports and guessed like, hey, these are the things that are being blocked, so we should add these to your policy. And so you should go through these though, make sure that you don't actually have anything malicious. Um, but this is, uh, it says, hey, should we allow something with the origin of HTBS static.schedule.org? And of course, you want that, sure, that sounds good. Um, you can kind of see how it changes. You can't read it, but you can see how it changes. And basically, it's just adding that host um, to your proposed policy. Over here, it says cdn.schedule.ws. Um, oh, for an image source. <coughs> Should I allow images from there? Sure, that sounds good. We'll add that one. Do I want to add scripts from this one, this one, this one? Sure. And styles from here. So fantastic. So using this, it added all those hosts um, to our policy. So we can go back to Enforcer, um, and we can test this new policy out. Um, and so I just put the policy in here. You can see it kind of sorts of by directives um, if you find that useful. And we'll refresh. And so, woo, the web page looks a lot better now, which is fantastic. So we got a lot of the content. There's still some things wrong. Like, I think these are supposed to be on the same line, and there's some mess over here. But it does look a lot better. Um, on the bottom, we see we get a lot more errors still. Um, most of these. So normally when I install new policy, what I do is I just go and delete all the reports. Um, all the reports are from uh, the, the previous install policy, so I just delete them. I don't see any need to hold on to them anymore. Um, if you want more reports, you can just generate them later. Um, so we'll clear that out, and then we'll load some new reports. We'll come back to Casper. We'll see we now have six reports. Um, most of these, if they don't have a block to run, that means they were either an inline or an eval, um, which uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but we'll see we have another uh, piece of content loaded here, um, a font source from cdn.schedule and a font source from fonts.gstatic that didn't get included, um, usually because like some JavaScript wasn't working or something that later requested, um, but now that we have JavaScript sort of working, we can re-include it, update our policy, and there we go. We'll look at the reports again. Oops. So um, basically just hit refresh, it wants to generate some new reports. So we'll go analyze the reports. And at this point, we see that since there's no block to arise, we've successfully included all the external hosts that we want to include in our policy, which is fantastic. So now all we have left is including um, script sources, or inline scripts, inline styles, and JavaScript evals. So you can go to the inline eval helper. Um, this will tell you where all your problems are. Um, so this first one right here, it says, uh, it, since there's a source file, um, that means there's an eval located um, in cdn.schedule.ws on um, column number 597, or line number 590, or 567. Um, you can get more details about this, it just kind of tells you how this report has changed over time. But um, if we really want to, I mean, we could go to this, you could go look at this file and you'll see the eval there. Um, I'm guessing this is an externally included script from somewhere. Hopefully you can look at that eval, see if you can remove it. Um, hopefully you can, if you can, um, which seems to be the case a lot of the times, you can use an inline eval. Um, but something to keep in mind. Uh, the next one, we look at here. Um, I actually did go and look at the, the source here. It's, it's just a, an eval right there. Um, so it didn't look like it was doing anything that important, so hopefully you can remove it. Um, if you were this website owner, um, the next one is a, it has five counts. Um, it doesn't give you a, 
a line number, or a column number, or a source file, which just means it's in line. So if you go and view the page source of this thing, um, right on the main page, oops, sorry, right up here, um, there's some inline JavaScript, kind of hard to see, but that's what's filing a lot of reports. If you go through the document, there's just a whole bunch of inline JavaScript. Unfortunately, the website owner is going to have to go through and remove all those, but that seems to be accounting for the rest of the script sources, is that inline. And then um, the next, you look at directed style sources. These are just inline style sources. Um, you go through, you remove them, and you call it good. And now you have the CSV policy installed. And so from this point on, um, what I would do is just go out and clear all the reports. Once you have your official CSP um, policy done, go to your web server, put it in report-only mode for a while, just so you can kind of see how it, uh, your clients are going to handle it, um, see if there's anything you missed. Um, but on that point in report-only mode, um, you monitor it, just go to analyze, see what happens, um, everything looks good, put it on the, the enforce mode, um, so just CSP, not CSP report mode, um, and see what happens. At that point, you should have CSP installed, and, and your website will be a lot more secure. One thing um, I did mention, filters. Uh, Let's go generate some garbage real quick. So I'm um, just generating more reports so I can show you how uh, the filters work, but we need a good... I don't, I don't actually have any garbage right now, so normally I'd like to show you garbage, but this website just doesn't have any... no garbage is being injected, so we don't have to worry about that, which is good. Uh, so let's say for some reason um, you were getting a lot of um, blocked URIs with this value. This value is uh, s7.addthis.com. Um, maybe it's an ISP or something. You don't really know where it comes from, but you don't really care about it at all, and you just don't want to see reports related to this. Um, what you can do is go to filters. Um, hard to see, but it, basically you're giving the filter a name. I usually just give it the host name, and then um, the field that you want to block. Um, so this says block your URI, and we're looking to block the URI, and then it just accepts a regular expression of you know, what to look for. So you just put in the host, you add the filter, there's your filter, um, which is pretty useful. Um, you can click on more. So it just, it's, this says, this is the host name. It says that it's looking for fields of blocked array, and this is the regular expression it's looking for. You can click on more. It shows that it's blocking two reports uh, that match this filter string. Um, you can edit it. Uh, these are inputs, and here are the two reports it's blocking, or the groupings of reports. So if you go back to analyze, you'll see that um, this thing no longer exists, which is what you want. So filtering worked correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all of Casper, um, so, uh, check it out, um, it's free to use, open source, it's on GitHub, um, use it to install CSP policies. Cool. Okay, um, so we just did demo part two. So, uh, the future. So, um, I got some feedback about Casper, a lot of people seem to be using Casper, they like it, uh, which I think is fantastic, um, so it's, it's still there, freely available. Um, some people, they have their own, like, uh, log viewing tools, like some people want to use Elasticsearch or Splunk or something like that, which is fine. Um, so I started creating like this thing called CSP lips, kind of taking all the components of Casper and kind of dissecting them and taking them out, because some people only wanted reporting, some people only wanted filtering, and so I um, started building this thing, it's pretty much done actually, uh, it's the, the CSP lib, and these are just all the little components. So CSP parse um, is a, just a Node.js uh, module for parsing and extending installs, policies. Um, it's what uh, Enforcer uses up here, this little guy, so like, if you go to like default source and you actually want star or something, it's kind of like what builds the policy and like manages and makes sure that policies look good and corrects any errors, the actual policy strings. Um, which is, there's CSP storm, um, this is for uh, generating violation reports really quickly for testing your endpoints and testing your filters. Um, it just generates a bunch of like really garbage looking reports really fast. Um, just to make sure everything's working correctly. CSP endpoint, um, this is just a command line tool. You just say CSP endpoint, um, it 
creates an, like an HTTP server for you with an endpoint name, you can set that as your report URI, you know, collect all the reports, and it just dumps them out as JSON. It grabs all the fields, does classification, and so what you're left with is just a command line tool that pops out a bunch of JSON with all of your reports. And so then you can feed that into a file, feed it into whatever log sort of elastic search thing that you use that you like. Um, does a, it's actually a pretty helpful tool. Um, CSP filtering. A lot of Neil and I were talking about like different field attributes um, or different policies that we see a lot, or different reports we see a lot that are usually just garbage and can be discarded. Um, we're putting those in CSP filters so no one else has to look at all those garbage reports that we don't think are useful. Um, and then two other libraries that haven't started um, are Express CSP nonce and Express CSP hash. Um, these are just Express middlewares, so that'll generate nonces and hash values for you. Kind of also work based off of what Neil did, um, but I think he did his in Ruby. Um, I just an Express middleware, so if you must have inlines, these are kind of a framework for you to kind of tag the things that you want to have nonces and things you can tag things that you want to have. Uh, hashes, which I wouldn't exactly recommend. Um, it'd be best if you can move all the JavaScript outside of the HTML files, but sometimes that isn't always uh, possible. So, um, once that's done, um, I think it's right now they're in uh, GitHub slash Kaga. I think I'm going to move that over to GitHub uh, CSP Lips. If anyone's interested in Devin, uh, just shoot me an email. I'd love to have more people working on it. But uh, other than that, um, so uh, that's it. Today we talked about same origin policy, uh, content screen policy. Um, how it generates the reports so you know what's wrong. We talked about the two tools, Casper and Enforcer, and uh, the new collection of tools that is coming out. Uh, it is out, but you don't kind of uh, see right now, uh, called CSP tools. So uh, that wraps up the presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah. You thought all about generating CSP policies for different international domains. For example, Airbnb.com uses like Google Maps, and so, we whitelisted all of Google's API endpoints mm -hmm. for their US domain. And then we're using the same uh, CSP policy on, like, let's say, our, our Hong Kong site or our French site. But um, there, Google is making requests to its uh, French or like East Asia API endpoints, and so we're getting a bunch of violations there. Do you have a good what are solution the for figuring out all these different what, um, so what's throwing the violation? I'm not quite sure. Google Maps will load files from Google CDN. And so it's a oh. different origin, depending on your origin. But there's not exactly a one-to-one app ink mic. Let's say where your website is to what all its different, uh, where all the different types of on the pages are requested. See, and it's not subdomain? They're coming from completely different origins? It's not they, like... They are... They are they're from... Like the, the TLD is different. Oh, I, oh, I got you. So it's like Google Maps on this. You can generate, uh, and it's a, it's a very unique problem, yeah. I'm not sure what the, the best solution that. I think, I mean, you can include all of them. I mean, that's one solution right there. Just make a list, add all the TLDs, and put that in your policy. Um, if you know like, where the user's going to be searching, I mean, you can change the policy per request. So if you know that the user's looking in this area, and hopefully they're not looking in another area, you can include just those subdomains, or just those TLDs. Um, that's an interesting problem, though. I'd be interested in taking a look if you want to shoot me an email later. But, any other questions? Awesome. Okay, well, oh. So you said, is it you need any kind of back end, or, or is it uh, you use Mongo with what other back end can you do? Um, so, yeah, I, right now I inject everything in a MongoDB, um, just so I built it for myself. Um, but yeah, it, uh, you get JSON, so you just get JSON strings. Anything, if you write a JSON parser to your own favorite back end, then you can use your own favorite back end. Yeah. You can, I mean, you can put it to text file if you really want. It doesn't really matter too much. Yeah. Any other questions? Like in the GitHub, when you download your version, it's have to have the code. Mm -hmm. You want to deploy, I mean, if you're using something else, you have to like, rewrite it. Yeah, you would have to write code to do that, though. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that, just running a wrap around the DB layer. Not everyone uses Mongo or likes Mongo. That's something that is on the chopping block um, to do. If you use the Heroku thing, um, that uses Mongo to be by default, um, just because it's simple. You just click one button and it works. But yeah, you can deploy, you can deploy uh, Casper locally. Um, it's pretty much just node or node and start, just one command and it just it runs. So. Yeah, so going off the other question there, do you know of any resources for people who are embedding stuff like Google Maps or Facebook like buttons or things like that? So that you know you know that you're embedding Facebook like buttons, so you know that you'll need to make your CSV changes like this. 
Um, I, I don't really know any resources. Oh, I can look it up, yeah. You just shoot me an email. It's definitely up. interested in helping. Yeah, no. Any other questions? How about if you're following the standards check? Do you know if there's like something out there where, like, if like what's this writing you guys where they detail all of the like where they basically say like add this to your CSP policy? It seems like it would be a very useful thing for Google or Facebook or any of these other API providers to have. I haven't seen anything like I haven't seen anything like that, but I mean that'd be a good idea. I'm not part of the policy group. I'm just a student who read the draft and started building tools. Yeah. I don't really know CSP that well, I just build stuff. Any other questions? Have you looked at the different frameworks that <laughs> yeah, unfortunately I use AngularJS, so I don't really worry about that too much. For everyone else though, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you just have to put that eval statement and kind of bug them for a while. I know it was kind of frustrating. I think jQuery, was still, they might still be using evals. I think they got, they got rid of them? Thank God, okay. Yeah, like for a while jQuery still had evals and stuff and so it was breaking your CSP. Django, but also CSP compliant. Oh really? Oh nice, okay. So uh, there's, a, there's another one. So. Um, yeah, talk to those people, try to get it pushed out. I mean, it sh they should have support for that. I mean, CSP is a, I mean, it's a very important thing and it's doing a lot of great good. You'd think that uh, these front end frameworks would do a little bit better, but I'm sure they have their own schedule. So, have you had any instances where you've had uh, CSP? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, there are still ways you can trip up, definitely. Um, like I said, uh, you can have it using uh, the header tag or using a meta tag within your HTML. Um, the header is way more preferable because it's still possible to get an injection um, in your HTML. So like, oh, let me just... Let's say like you had a dynamic title generation. Your title is in your head block of your HTML. If you screw that up somehow and your, your CSP thing was after where you specified your HTML title, an attacker could possibly inject a meta tag with a, new, a different CSP um, policy that would still get injected. So like, that's, that's one possible example. Another more common example is uh, if let's say you include anything from self, but you generate and so you'll have a script like that'll be on self like js dot or app dot js or something. If you die or if you dynamically generate app dot js, it's still possible for attackers to put an injection in app dot js. It'll look like it's coming from the server and it's valid. So make sure if you're still Does that make sense? <laughs> no. Okay, cool beans. So one of the, the things in the policy that says is that um, CSP is a defense in depth. You should always make sure that you're using filtering on the input and coding on the output. So if you are doing dynamic generation in something like app.js that's loaded on the server, it's still possible to get an injection in there because they're still able to execute or inject JavaScript into your JavaScript files. Okay. Well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for the questions. So, or something, just feel free to shoot me an email. My name is Sir Larson or Conrad. Um, I want to get help. You can Google me, you'll find me. Thank you.